I've never seen a class be this quiet. These guys are awesome. Everybody's talking usually, and uh, you guys settle down for, for no reason at all. That's great. How are you? How's everybody doing? Good. Good morning. And uh, I was up here trying to fiddle around, trying to get the clickers to work. I was going to do a little dry run on that again. There's no clicker credit yet until next week, but I couldn't quite get it running. I don't know. I got some little thing. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Um, so we're going to start talking in earnest uh, about uh, the material today in the class. So what I really what I want to talk about is really introduce you to the uh, field of social psychology. Uh, and the way I do that is to talk about this idea of the power of the situation, which is this central notion uh, in social psychology. So we're going to just do a little quick definitional stuff, and then we're going to talk about social norms and roles within that context, talk about one of the really famous, maybe infamous studies in the history of social psychology, the Stanford Prison Experiment. Uh, and we're going to talk about the idea of conformity uh, and you know, why, how people mold their behavior to fit with the behavior of other people, a couple of different classic experiments. Uh, in, in social psychology in that realm and then talk about this conceptual idea of normative versus informational social influence. It's really this central, central idea. Um, logistical stuff. Daniel, there was something I was supposed to remember to say. So one of the things, that we'll, under one comment that I'm getting a lot of is about the readings and where the readings correspond to the different uh, days. So again, you know, that, that little schedule is kind of compacted um, and so it's a little hard to read, but again, right next to every day, so it'll be a, the lecture that we're having that day, two a week, and there'll be a bunch of readings right next to it. Some out of the text, some out of the um, reader with the pages and everything. So you just want to read the stuff that's right next to it. Sometimes it'll go down to the next line or something, it'll skip over, but it should be fairly clear. There's two sets of readings for every week, except for a week when there's only one lecture, then there's only a little one set of readings. So those are the ones you want to try to read uh, beforehand. Final exams. Final exams on Thursday, not on Tuesday. And, and Daniel's already, if you remember, there's a little typo on the um, study, or on the uh, uh, syllabus, and Daniel's Revise that now so that, again, it's on Thursday. You really don't want to get up at 8 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday for no apparent reason. So make a note of that. Um, one other thing, it would, uh, when I post the uh, PowerPoints, which I think the ones from last week are already posted, right? I'll sometimes alter them a little bit. I'll try to move pictures around so you can see things a little bit better. Uh, and uh, like if I have movie clips, those movie clips won't be in there, right? Because those, the whole file has to go up. And so there, there won't be the, the movie clips that, that, that we see in those. But that, so they're sort of slightly altered a little bit. Um, and if you are, are still trying to get in the class, how many people are still on the wait list trying to get in the class? Well, we need you to do again after class today, come back here, go down over here, sign up, uh, sign a little sheet that Daniel will have, and we're working on that. Hopefully, everything will work out so that most or, I don't, I hate to say things like that, most or all of you will get in the class. We're going to work, try really hard to get everybody in that wants to get in, since we have here you know, a fair amount of room. Um, so, I think that's all the logistical stuff. So, don't bother with your clickers, but let me ask you, I'm gonna start off with a question. This is the way the clicker questions will look. I'll put a question up like this and have you respond, uh, you know, A, B, or C, or D, or whatever. I guess it goes all the way to E. Um, so in this case, here's the question I wanna ask you. Do you think that human behavior is really determined mostly by people's personalities? So people have certain traits that are consistent over time that they show there's some people that have these traits and that's, if you really want to know they're, you're, they're, what they're going to do, you want to know about them, or do you think but human behavior is mostly determined by situational external forces, right? Or maybe something else. How many people think that behavior is just mostly a function of personality? If you want to know what people are going to do, you want to know what, what, what their personality is. Come on, raise your hands. If you don't think, how many people think it's external forces? Ooh, lots of people. Anybody think of something else? Okay, what is it? Both. Both. Yeah, that's always the right answer, right? And in fact, that is the right answer. 
right? But what most people, unlike you guys, most people, when you ask them, will th you know, the average person thinks about the world as if they're a personality psychologist. They think, I know you. I know what you're like. You're a good person. You're a nice person, so I can count on you to do the right thing. Or you're a bad person, right? You're an aggressive person, or you're a helpful person. Right? And that's what I need to know about you to know about your behavior. What social psychology does and why it's sort of fundamentally sort of counterintuitive to most people, except for you guys who already seem to know this, right, is that what they want to argue is the, and are interested in, what social psychologists are interested in is the way that your behavior is shaped by the situations that you inhabit and the people that you're around. How you are embedded in this social matrix right, that determines what you do and the people around you are very integral to, to the sort of behaviors that you enact, right. And it's the scientific study of that. It's the, it's the sort of begins with that kind of an assumption and then tries to go and make that point empirically. So try to create situations to see whether those situations will affect what it is that people do in various ways. So just to give you a, a definition, social psychology is this huge field, so huge in a, in a sense and so diverse that uh, one person I know defines social psychology as anything a social psychologist studies. Right, so social psychology is fundamentally the study of sort of everyday human social behavior. All the things that you do and all the different ways that you do it. So there's kind of a sense of which it's almost like a grab bag category. It's, it's if you can't figure out what a study, you know, what, what, what something, what field something belongs to, yeah, it's, it's kind of social psychology almost by default, right? More specifically and technically, I'll just give you a couple, sometimes I'll, I'll give you definitions of things, and no, any definition is always arbitrary, so I like to give kind of multiple uh, definitions. Uh, so this is one I pulled out of a you know, well-known social psychology textbook. It's the scientific study of the feelings, thoughts, and behaviors of individuals in social situations. So that's very vague, right? It's just it's everyday behavior. It's all the things that you do and the feelings that you have, the thoughts that you have, uh, and the behavior you enact in, in, in uh, situations, right? Particularly individuals and how they function in social settings. Duh, social psychology, it's about how people behave in social settings, right? A somewhat more, I think, interesting definition and a kind of classic one from uh, one of the originators of the field, a guy named Gordon Alport uh, in, in his 1954 book, uh, talked about uh, social psychology as an attempt to understand and explain the thought, feeling, and behavior of individuals uh, or how the thought, feeling, and behavior of individuals are influenced by the actual imagined or implied presence of others. That kind of captures more this notion of this, how people are affected by the social situation. So an attempt to understand and explain how the thought, feeling, and behavior of individuals, how what you think, feel, and do is affected by other people, by actual other people, by sometimes imagined other people, right? Or implied other people. Right, how your behavior is affected by the people around you. Uh, so I often, this is, I was really proud, this is actually the same basic slide I've used since I think 1985, when the Macintosh first came out, right? I made this slide, it was one of the first people that, you know, that used Mac, people were blown away, right? This is like nothing anybody has seen before. It's like, whoa, you can draw on a computer. Wow, so now it looks ridiculous. I still like it. It captures what social psychology is. Social psychology is about people, about individuals, right? Psychology is a study, the unit of analysis is people, is individuals, right? But how they're enmeshed in this social fabric. So, and there's really kind of two ways that that happens and that the kind of can be separated but also blur together. So again, your behavior, how you think, feel, and act is affected by other people. Right, so the people that you're around can affect you. And that's largely, that's what we're gonna be talking about for the next couple of days, kind of how the people around you affect what it is that you do, right? And again, these people don't always have to be actually there. My mother affects my behavior all the time. My mother's passed away 20 some years ago, right? She's not here, but when I do things, oh, my mom wouldn't like that, right? People don't have to be, they could be in your mind, they could be, the, the, when you're alone, there's still that, those people around you and the things that they, uh, you think that they believe can affect you, right? 
So the other part of social psychology, of course, is how you perceive other people. And we're going to study, at the, uh, at the end of this section, we're going to talk a lot about how it is that I make judgments about other people, how people are affected by, for example, the race of somebody else, what sex they are, what ethnicity they are, right? And other sorts of things. How do I make judgments about you? And sometimes those sorts of characteristics will affect the way people make judgments. Right? So you can sort of separate out some of the psychology is about how people are affected by other people, some of it is about how people perceive other people, but the whole thing sort of circles around each other because you're affected by not actual people and actual behavior, but what you believe those other people are like. Right? So you might perceive them in some way and you might think they all want you to do something and that's what affects your behavior even if they don't really want to do those things. Right? So the whole thing sort of wraps, we're affected by how we think other people are by the implied sometimes pre uh, presence, the imagined presence of other people or the perceived presence of other people. So we're here in the middle of this kind of social web, right? We think we're alone, we think we're Cartman, right? We think, well, I do what I want, right? But you don't always do what you want. Sometimes other people affect what it is that you do. And what I want to talk to you about over the next few days is how profound that influence can be. Right, how deeply the presence of other people affect our behavior. This idea really originated, the, 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 uh, the, the first, you know, social psychology as a discipline is actually very new, right? It's a century old or so. But people have been musing about human behavior since the dawn of time, right? And the first social psychological hypothesis is often uh, credited uh, to Plato who said that uh, had every Athenian citizen been a Socrates, every Athenian assembly would still have been a mob, right? It's a really interesting statement, a sort of fundamentally social psychological one. What he's saying is, well, it doesn't matter who you are. Socrates generally held up as getting one of the sort of the, the icon of logic and reason and calm deliberation. He was a highly principled person, and Plato says, it doesn't matter, give me a whole bunch of, Pla give me a whole bunch of Socrateses, but if you put them in a particular situation, if they're all together in a big crowd, right, they're gonna go, that's going to be crazy, right? They're going to act in mob-like ways. And this idea, we're going to come back to this at various times, that the, you know, this, this sort of notion of kind of mob or crowd psychology is one of the first things that people notice in social psychology, one of the things that people uh, you know, really tried to explain, right? So it's an, and it's an interesting idea, and we talked about it last time a little bit, how it, at games and things like that, you can, people will do things that they would never do in any other situation, right? And it doesn't matter who they are. Here's my, one of my favorite pictures. This is a Princeton-Harvard uh, basketball game. And so this is, you know, the, this, like you guys, this is the cream of the crop of American society, all these, you know, brilliant college kids, and they're, they're torturing this poor guy. They're acting, one guy's dressed up in an orange suit, Right? You put people in a situation and people act crazy. They can act crazy in good ways. They can act crazy. When I mean crazy, I mean atypical, unusual for them, right? So we know that when you put people in situations, they'll change. And so that's this notion that situations can affect people's behavior is one that's an old one, right? But it's an idea that still sort of carries a lot of power and has been explored empirically for many, many years. So if we jump ahead, couple of millennia, right? We get to this idea, so what, you know, what is this notion that, that people, do we, do, what, why do we think that people might be affected by situations? Well, interesting, there's, there was a point, uh, again, social psychology being a relatively new discipline, you know, it, it developed in terms of its, its influence and its power. Uh, you know, long before that, personality psychologists were around and they were trying to sort of explore uh, you know, the consistencies of people's behavior, trying to measure personality, that's always been an, a major aspect of personality psychology, and we're going to talk about that later, right? But there were, in the late 1960s, there was kind of a crisis in that field, right? Where a guy, a uh, well-known uh, researcher, uh, even at that time, his name was Walter Michel, that's him uh, in the corner, uh, sort of went and looked at the actual data of so when he, he went in and looked at a whole bunch of different situations, the sort of classic uh, idea would be you give somebody a personality test 
uh, you know, about on, their honesty, their extroversion or whatever. And then you measure, you might see, you might have them take a test, you might observe their behavior in different situations where, let's say, honesty was an important uh, quality. And you might see honesty in the classroom, uh, you know, honesty in, in some other sort of uh, situation, other interpersonal situation. And what he found when he looked at those things is that there was very, very little evidence of cross-situational consistency in behavior. That whether we think that if somebody is a good, if there's somebody's going to, the basic idea is we think if somebody's going to cheat in the classroom, most of us kind of think, oh, they're probably going to cheat in the bedroom, and in fact, maybe they'll even cheat on their taxes, right? That they are cheaters, that they have that fundamental characteristic of being a cheater, there's something about them. And what Walter Michel found is there was very little empirical evidence for this, right? That the correlation between people's honest, their, whether they were honest in one situation wasn't very high with whether they were honest in another one, that, that it couldn't predict whether you were honest in one situation, didn't predict well whether you're gonna be honest in another one. That somehow across situations, things differed and changed, right? And you could understand behavior much better if you didn't sort of assume that people were always going to act the same, that they had these characteristics, you had to recognize that situations have power to change people's behavior, right? So it was kind of this crushing critique, and we'll come back later and talk about uh, you know, how the concept of personality changed a little bit to incorporate that, but for now, we want to know, so how is it, what, what, and how, how, what do I mean by this, that your behavior is affected by uh, situations? You have, how does this happen? So let's talk about some sort of simple ways. I'll give you some examples of this idea. Uh, the first sort of simplest way to talk about this idea is this concept of social norms, which really comes from sociology as much as from psychology. But a norm is uh, uh, basically a rule. Right, so it's a situation, the, the way to define norms, they're situation specific rules for accepted or expected behavior. So they're the sort of the normal behavior in a particular situation, what's expected out of you. And this is essentially what, this is what culture gives us, right? And we can, you can think about a norm, there's other words you know, uh, that you might use like customs, folkways, traditions, fashions, right? They're things that People start doing these things and then everybody sort of assumes that this is the way it should be done. And there's different kinds. There's, there's a distinction in norms that are called what are called injunctive or prescriptive norms versus descriptive norms, right? We always have these you know, fancy words for things. So an injunctive or a prescriptive norm is a norm that has some sort of moral compulsion, some sort of ought. Uh, uh, you know, part to it. So what people should or ought to do in a given situation. Right, and some norms are like that. We have rules, we have these moral rules about things. Like, like people should wear pants, right? And if you don't wear pants, one of you came into class with, if I came up here without pants, you guys would go, man, that's wrong. That's just wrong, that's bad. It's not just unusual, it's, the, it's bad, right? We have rules about who you should sleep with, about who you should, uh, you know, how you should behave in all sorts of different situations. And sometimes they have that kind of moral power. Sometimes there are things that are they're prescriptive. You should do this. Other norms are sort of are these more subtle things that are they're called descriptive norms. They're just kind of what people do do, right? What people empirically seem to do, the, the kinds of behaviors of people. They don't necessarily have a big sort of uh, shame or ought component to them, but they're just sort of there. And things just vary on that dimension. Like again, you guys are all sitting here very quietly, nicely listening to me. Which is weird. Any other, if I went to another group of people and just started talking, they wouldn't sit there quietly. And if they disagreed with me about something, they wouldn't stand or they wouldn't be quiet, but you guys are doing that, right? And again, if you if you were a little noisy or something, yeah, we'd, we'd kind of think badly, but, but this is just kind of what people do. So why do you do that? Why are these things, why do people seem to behave in ways that the reason you're acting like this is because of the situation you're in, right? You're in this situation. Um, again, they tend to be culture specific. So the rules in one culture aren't always the same as the rules in, in others. Things like you know, personal space or what you wear, how much of your skin you can reveal. 
those kinds of things are changed. So the, what's expected and what's shamed, which, you know, in, in, in some, certain cases, the, the sort of injunctive prescriptive component of it, right? What's, what we see is bad is different across different cultures. And what culture does is it teaches you when you get socialized into these rules. And the rules are really hard for you to recognize because they're so deeply ingrained in you. They're so fundamental. They're so automatic in you that you don't even know that your behavior is being guided by those things, right? That so you don't realize that the situations you would have that have rules and you tend to change your behavior to fit with those rules. One of my, you know, a great example of this, when I was in college at UCLA, uh, there was a very famous uh, uh, sociologist there named Harold Garfinkel, and he was famous for uh, what he called breaching studies. And what breaching studies were, were times when he, he would tell you to go and just, or he would go and violate a norm that people don't even know really exists sometimes, right? So, it's the fancy word for his strategy was what he called ethnomethodology. So he would do little kind of social experiments in a sense, not very well controlled. But he told us to do this when I was in his class. He told us, he goes, go home over Christmas break and then violate a norm and see what happens. So what I did is I went home. I was a you know, 19, 20-year-old kid. And uh, you know, I got home and I was, you know, my parents were sitting there at the kitchen counter. And I went up to the refrigerator and I said, Mother, is it okay if I open up the refrigerator and get myself something to eat? My mom had no idea how to answer that question. She never heard me ask to open the refrigerator. It was simple, very simple, very subtle thing, right? She had no idea. She was used to me sort of opening up the refrigerator, grabbing whatever was left, you know, tonight's dessert or something and eating it. Right, but just the, and that's what happens when you violate norms. People just kind of go, uh, 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 they don't really quite know what to do. It's disruptive, and the, that's why they exist. They exist to kind of lubricate social interactions. That makes things much easier if there's just simple kinds of rules for things. Right, you know what to do. You don't always have to come into a new situation and figure out what the heck you do. The culture prescribes for you various rules. So, but in a real sense, it determines your behavior. Right. So let me give you another example of something like this. So this is, so this is mostly for the guys. So, okay, guys, you go into a urinal, you go into a restroom, there's three urinals there, A, B, and C. Which one do you go to? Not B. How many people say A? How many people say B? How many people say C? So why, how did you know that you don't go to B? There's a rule, is there a sign? It says that? No, but guys know that, right? You don't go to, you go to, you go in there, you go to the first, you either go to that one or you go to that one and everything's cool, right? And if the first guy goes to that one, the second guy goes to that one, right? There's rules. You didn't know that. But interestingly enough, social psychologists have actually studied this exact situation. Did a study to examine this. this is a good example of the kind of things that social psychologists do, the kind of unusual trying to take a real world phenomenon and recreate it. So uh, this, this set of studies were done in the 70s. So if the guy goes there, that's no good, right? <laughs> so you hit the road, right? If somebody goes in and goes the other one, that's bad. So they did a study to kind of capture that exact phenomenon. I kid you not, the guy's name was Middle Mist. So it's a scientist named Middle Mist who did a study. And so what he uh, did is he would uh, wait till somebody, a regular everyday person, went into the urinal, uh, went into the restroom, and went to, to in, invariably, they went to one of the, the, the side ones. And then they would send in a guy, a confederate, is a term we'll use a lot, somebody who worked for the experimenter in there to go use B there, right? And then interesting, what they wanted to do is kind of see what kind of behavior this person exhibited. And uh, they came up with this clever idea of using uh, the, the, the measure that they used about this kind of anxiety was delayed urination. How long it took the guy to start peeing. <laughs> and they had a person in one of the stalls with a periscope, <laughs> right, looking out with a, with a stopwatch. And they measured how long it took somebody to pee in that situation. And they found out that if somebody came in and went to the other urinal, the one on the side, it took people, people the, the guy, the first guy started peeing much faster, right? When somebody came in and, and got right next to him, it 
cause anxiety because it's like, why is this person doing this, right? And disruptive. Go ahead, question. Speak up real loud. The researcher's name's not really Sure it is. It's his name. Seriously. Seriously. <laughs> Isn't it great? The world just works out like that sometimes, right? So. What's interesting is it might be, well, maybe it's just, you know, maybe it's just, inv- they wanted to kind of tease us apart a little bit. Maybe it's really just invasion of personal space, you know. Uh, you know, that was, that's kind of part of the phenomenon anyway, but they were, they're really interested in what would happen if, if there was some reason to justify why the person did that, or if it was just them being that close. And so they ran another condition where they put an out of order sign on that one. When the guy came in, Afterwards, went there, there was no delay in urination. Because, well, why is that? The guy's just as close to you, but there's a reason why he went to that one. And so everything kind of works out, right? Yeah. So he's happy. Yahoo. Um, so you didn't know that your behavior in bathrooms and things like that was determined by these kinds of rules. But they are, and they're so subtle you don't have to think about them. That's the, that's the powerful part. You don't think about these things. They just are there, right? And they, they help you understand and negotiate the world in a fairly simple way. And, they're all of, and there's lots of norms. If you think about the situations that you go into, uh, that they may, uh, very often have these simple rules that we follow. So our behavior sort of gets molded in the situations we go to. There's another kind of norm or an extension of this norm concept, which is the idea of social roles, right? So the idea of social roles, again, another kind of sociological concept to, to a certain extent, right? And uh, roles are just sets of norms that define how people in a given social position ought to behave. So scientists use the term role just like the term role is used in acting, and it's often called the dramaturgical approach, and many people have made that analogy, right? all the world's a stage, right? That people take on roles, and roles are these, it's, it, there are sets of norms that define how you are if you're in a certain social position. So I'm you know, a professor in this situation, and so there's certain ways that I behave. Right? You're a student in this situation, and there's various ways that you behave that are, that are prescripted in that. If, but when I'm a dad, I behave very differently. Right? When I'm in taking other situations. And so the important thing about roles, large part, is that they're defined, they're often reciprocal in the sense that they're defined by who you're with. So when I'm with you, I'm the typical professor, handsome, dashing, Right? I look for a typical professor picture. Of course, I settled on Indiana Jones because he's like the hero of all professors. It's the way professors should be like, right? You guys sit nicely. You guys are students. You quietly. I sit and lecture. Everything's fine. One of the more powerful roles I've ever had, though, is when I became a dad, right? And it was, it was shocking to me how quickly my behavior changed. I tell this to people all the time. Anybody have kids here? Anybody old enough? You got some non-traditional people, somebody in the back, right? It changes your whole being. And that's what's powerful about roles. You're in a different role. And all of a sudden, you're a father, and you're going, well, you know, turn those lights off. And, you know, what are you doing? And the music's too loud. And, you know, you, and you get very possessive. And, and, you know, sometimes you get this kind of weird, uh, uh, you know, overlap and, and blurring of the roles. One of my favorite examples of this is, you know, when you are when you're become a father, you become very protect, you know, protective. And I remember when my kids first got into the front seat of the car, you know, I would be really protective of them. And if I ever had to stop short, one time I had to stop short, I realized the very first thing I did is I threw my hand like that, <laughs> right, to, to guide my kids, you know, to, to protect them. And it was just really instinctual kind of response. I went, wow, that's powerful. Until, you know, not, it wasn't too much later, I was driving actually uh, across town with one of my female graduate students and uh, stopped short. I threw my head across her chest. <laughs> oh, no, you know, it's like, oh, no, that's wrong. <laughs> right? So you get the blurring of the roles a little bit sometimes, right? But there's these roles. And again, it really matters kind of who you're with. Who, how you adopt these roles. And then another thing, you know, I find, I don't know if you guys you find the situation, my wife always comments on this, that when I'm around my brothers or around my buddies, I actually grew, I live in San Clemente, I grew up in San Clemente, uh, so I see all my, you know, friends from school, my, my surfer buddy friends, and I start acting like that. My whole lingo changes, my whole persona changes, right? I become kind of like the surfer dude, you know, hey dude, what up, you know? And it, so it just kind of comes out, it just devolves, right? And that's what's powerful about roles is when they 
take over, right? They take over in this way that they can be all enveloping. They change in some way who you are. They change how you behave and the way you act, right? In some profound way. These, and again, so it's, and again, they're defined by who you're with. So when you're with different people, you can take on very different roles, act in very different ways. Uh, one of the great examples of this uh, is uh, empirical examples from social psychology is something that's called the Stanford Prison Experiment. How many people have heard of this before? Anybody? Lots of people. Right, it's, very, it's, not, it's not my favorite first couple of studies to talk about in social psychology. It's very atypical uh, and sort of unusually done, but it's very famous. So it was done by a guy named Phil Zimbardo, uh, who was a, a professor at Stanford University at the time, actually still is. Uh, and he was, it was at a time when there were a lot of prison riots. Um, at Attica and a variety of other places, uh, there was a lot of uh, you know, sort of disturbing violence in prisons. And most people, again, being like personality psychologists, said, yeah, here's the, I see the problem. The problem is those people, right? You put all those terrible prisoners in there, they're horrible people, they're going to behave violently. And who becomes a prison guard? Well, only the most sadistic, terrible people become prison guards. Of course, they fight, they're horrible to each other because they're just bad people. Right? Phil Zimbardo, again, being a social psychologist, had a very different way of thinking about it. He said it's not necessarily the people that are bad, it's the situation that's corrosive. When you put people, you give some people sort of absolute power, you take other people, you strip them of their power, you kind of humiliate them, and you're going to get these kind of terrible situations. And so he, in a classic social psychological form, decided to try to recreate this in the laboratory, actually do an experiment where he brought in students, mostly, volunteer who volunteered for a study of prison life, and he brought them in and created a prison in the basement of the Stanford University uh, psychology department, and you know, and created some. And, and what, what's, what's crucial about this is that he randomly assigned people to be either prisoners or guards. So he was, so anybody that walked in the door was equally likely to be a prisoner or a guard. So it wasn't like the sadistic people chose to be guards and the terrible lawbreakers chose to be prisoners, right? These were the, all kind of the cream of the crop of American society, right? These are you know, the best college students you could find. You put them in this situation and you wanted to see what happened. Let me show you a little five minute video clip of this uh, that tells you the story a little bit better and then we'll come back after that. Trying to turn up the volume here. The students who volunteered for the study were carefully tested. These had to be psychologically and physically healthy. You guys hear that okay? Some students were then randomly selected to act as prisoners, while others became guards. The researchers surprised the prisoners by having them arrested at their homes and dormitories. The prisoners went through the rituals to establish their new lowly status. They lived in tiny cells, 24 hours a day, cut off from their usual surroundings. What's happening to refrigerate Pictures are all blurry.
The situation became so overpowering that many of the prisoners developed extreme stress reactions and had to be released. But no one ever said, I quit the experiment. They had lost all perspective. Zimbardo forgot he was an experimenter and acted like a prison ward. Though the experiment was meant to last two weeks, it was pulled off after six days. I know it's a little hard to hear some of that. It's an old video and that's as high as it goes. But so that's, it was, it was this really interesting kind of situation where Zimbardo wanted to demonstrate that it really wasn't the people involved, right? That he, by random, by taking regular old, if, you know, if again, kind of cream of the crop people, putting them in there, right? Showing that if they became a guard, they would become brutal and sadistic and think of all these interesting ways to kind of torture people. He even allowed them to like pick their their costumes. They did they did interesting things like the, the guards wore uh, mirrored sunglasses. We're going to come back to that later. This mirror, so that they couldn't be seen. So they became kind of depersonalized, right? And then that kind of released their behavior even more. The guard the, the prisoners were were taken where they were they, they wore these like hospital gowns. So you take guys, you put them in a dress and it kind of emasculates them. It makes them feel you know, uh, you know, feminine and, and, and it demoralizes them and that, you know, so the, and they, they would play on that. There's all this kind of, you know, sort of uh, a lot of kind of, uh, you know, stripping naked and a lot of push-ups and a lot of, you know, kind of humiliating things like cleaning toilets and stuff like that. And they all created these things themselves. And again, the hard thing about the study, about understanding the study is that it's filled with a whole bunch of stories now that isn't clear. So the way that the, the, the basic stories go, if you want to learn more, you can go to this prisonexperiment.org has a you know, great a bunch of information about it. Again, very famous study. But the, the idea is that after six days, everybody had sort of lost track. That Phil Zimbardo, there was a rumor of a, of a prison break. Right, and then uh, he thought he, he he started to think, well, we got to stop this prison break. And he actually disassembled the entire prison, moved all of the the prisoners to a different to the county jail, right? 
Nobody ever showed up that night to break them out of jail, moved them back, and then he moved them back in. And they were talking about, look, we've got a prison break. And until, the, as the story goes, that Phil Zabarro tells, his fiance at the time kind of shook him and said, Phil, you know, you're not a warden, you're a prisoner. And he decided he had to stop the experiment, which was planned for two weeks after six days, right? It's, some of that's not clear what's going on. It's not clear, you know, what, what kind of science this, this is and how carefully things were monitored, but it's this wonderful demonstration. And it has a certain power of it that, that it's not the apples in the barrel, right? It's the bad barrel that can do it. And lately, uh, you know, you see examples of this kind of thing all the time. Phil Zimbardo, for example, was very vocal about making the connections between his Stanford prison experiment and what happened at uh, the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. How many people remember this story? The very beginning, you guys are young, the big, very beginning of the Iraq, uh, war, uh, there was, uh, it was discovered that the, one of the prisons that they were, uh, had created in Iraq had degenerated into really this kind of humiliating behavior, uh, taking the prisoners, stripping them naked, having dogs, uh, uh, you know, threaten them. Uh, doing also, and if, it's interesting that they did many of the things, these, these are sort of the more brutal, these are some of the famous pictures that came out of it. They should tell people there's something, some things are a little bit disturbing in these pictures, right? Uh, but it's interesting how similar, this is the Stanford prison experiment, where they did a lot of you know, cleaning of toilets, a lot of stripping naked, a lot of the sexual humiliation was something that they created too, right, to do this. And again, the, the point from Abu Ghraib that Phil, that, that, that Phil Zimbardo wanted to make is everybody blamed those people. They said, oh, there were seven guards in particular. They said, those must be really terrible people to have done that, right? And what Phil Zimbardo would say, no, it's the terrible situation. You put people in a situation where they have no accountability. There's nothing. They have these, an, an enemy that they think is morally inferior to them, right? And without any constraints. And they will do these terrible things sorts of things. And some of them are really remarkable. Again, to, to, to draw the point, one of the more famous pictures is this one. So here's this very sweet girl, smiling, taking a picture over a dead body. That she may very well have been the one that caused this person's death. It's hard to look at this girl, this woman, and think that she's a terrible person. Right? She did a terrible, she, she's doing a terrible thing. And that's the point, right? That Situations can have a power that can take over sometimes and make you sort of lose track of things that because of the dynamics of the situation, that's the point that Phil Zimbardo tries to make. And he's got a book about it he calls The Lucifer Effect. So that's the Stanford prison experiment. Again, very famous and a good example of the power that roles have to affect people. That if you take on a certain role, it can have this kind of all-encompassing power to it. Right? But how, did they, how does this happen? Why do people bend their behavior to fit with what other people do? And that's been a topic that social psychology has been very interested in. And uh, you know, the, the term that we use to talk about that is the same one that we all sort of know about uh, in our lay lives, the idea of conformity. Right? Why do people conform? Why do people very often do what other people are doing? Why do they follow the rules that other people have set? So conformity, let me just define it for you here a little bit. So conformity is a change in behavior or belief as a result of real or imagined group pressure. Right? So the idea of conformity, just like what we know, you know, that you conform to what other people are doing. You're doing something different in the presence of other people than you would normally, right? You fit your behavior. And we all know examples of this from high school. You know, you guys just came out of you know, these huge conformity machines. Not only do they make you do, the teachers have rules and things you have to do, but then people have rules. And they go, oh, you, you know, and they'll, the, you'll want to fit in with various people and, and, and do various things and, and change your behavior. You wear the things that they wear. You listen to the music that they listen to. Right? You change your behavior. And the idea is that in conformity is a, a classic example of the social psychological idea of changing based on the situation, right? So your behavior is different when you're in the presence of other people than when you're uh, not. And again, that's usually the way we think about conformity, right? It's that you, other people are smoking crack, so you decide, hey, dude, I'm gonna smoke some crack. That sounds cool, right? Other people are wearing some funny outfit, and you decide, oh, I'm gonna wear that funny outfit, right? You change your behavior, even though you might not always think it's a great idea. Now it's important to realize, however, right, that 
that sometimes you can change your behavior based on what other people do, but do it in opposition to it. This is what, again, I finally figured this out after a, after a few years. This is what my kids talked about, the hipsters. Kind of the kind of hipster phenomenon, right? It's like, you're all doing this. Well, I'm going to do something else. Well, it's important to realize that that's just, that's changing your behavior just as much as changing to be consistent with other people. If you're doing, you're not doing what you want if you're just doing what the opposite of what other people do is, right? No, everybody's doing that, so I'm going to do something else. That's just as determining, the situation is determining your behavior just as much as if you're doing the same thing. But it's not really what we're talking about, right? Conformity is usually changing to fit in with what other people do. The other thing is conformity, good or bad? Right? Yeah. Well, we usually think of it as bad. In the United States, it's got a bad rap, right? Should do your own thing. Shouldn't be influenced by other people. But the important thing to remember about the conformity is it's absolutely crucial to the functioning of society. You're not going to be too happy if you see somebody doing their own thing on the 405 freeway saying, you all want to drive on the right side of the road. Well, screw that, dude. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to drive on the left side of the road. Right? That'll, that'll be cool, man. You know, everybody will notice me. Yeah, they'll notice you for a few seconds. Right? So society requires, it's, it's, it's the same idea about norms. If you do, people need to sort of fit in with society because it makes everything go better. It makes things go smoothly. Now, it's, it has a bad side when you're changing your behavior, but also is a fundamental part of social behavior, right? That we conform, we look to other people to figure out what to do, and we do those things, right? So it's an interesting phenomenon to think about. Uh, and social psychologists have been thinking about this for, uh, you know, uh, many, many years. One of the really famous early experiments in social psychology was a, the examination of conformity done by a guy named Musafer Sharif, who's a Turkish social psychologist. And he was, he was really interested in what, what uh, Musafer Sharif was interested in is, is in these social norms. He was interested in why is it that people have these rules that seem to persist over time Kind of for no reason. People are doing all the same thing, but they don't really know why. My favorite example is wearing a tie. And why is it that people walk around wearing a stupid little piece of cloth around their neck? Right? It doesn't, you can't even wipe your mouth on it, right? You can't do it. It's got no function. But if you go to certain places without a tie, right, that's a big problem. Right? But every, and everybody does, but people don't even think, they just wear the tie. They just do this. So why, how do things like that develop? How do norms, this is what Lucifer Sharif was uh, setting. He wanted to see if, again, if he could take that phenomenon out in the real world, bring it into the, into the laboratory, and kind of pick it apart. So he created this situation that uh, takes advantage of what's called the autokinetic effect. The autokinetic effect, the auto means self, kinetic means movement. So the basic idea is if you take people, you put them in a completely dark room, and you flash a light across the room, right? When they don't have any uh, cues to where it is, that light, you can't keep your eye on anything, your eye, your 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 uh, you know, visual focus moves like this a little bit, no matter what. Now, when I've got all this context around me, it's not like you guys move because I know I can see everything, and it doesn't. My brain stabilizes that. But if you make it dark, right? When that, when your eye moves, it makes it appear as if that light's moving a little bit, right? Because you can't keep your eye on it straight when there's no cues to tell you it's 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 staying straight. So it looks like it drifts, but it's not drifting really at all. Right, but it looks like it's drifting to people. And so he put people in this kind of room and he asked people, you know, so how, how much is that light moving? Would you say it's two inches, four inches, eight inches, what, you know, how much is it moving? And he would ask people that. And he would, in the initial sort of studies, he would, or in the initial situation, he would ask people while they're alone. And if you ask, put people in alone in a room, and you ask them, their, their, their estimates will vary all the way from, you know, an inch or two to, you know, a couple of feet. So there, there's a lot of variation. But what happens when you put people together? in that situation. And they're asked to estimate the movement of light. And so that's what he did. So he put people, he uh, had some people do it alone, and then he would bring in uh, uh, another, one other person. Uh, well, actually, in this situation, there are three people all together, right? And there's, this is the, the initial trial, when, uh, I guess, when they're alone. And then the, this is after, when they're together, they're together, they're together, right? After two, three, after they do it one, two, three different times. So in the first thing, again, what you get when they're alone is you get this, these are just hypothetical subjects, one, two, and three. You get a big variation. So high, you know, one's up here at eight. Uh, these guys are down here at one or two. And then what happens when they do it, they, they start doing it together, right? So when they do it, when they're, they're all together the first time, all of a sudden, 
their estimates start to converge. Right, they're all really much closer than they were when they were alone. They do it a second time, they converge even more. By the third time, they're giving exactly the same answer. Right, they're conforming. They're, so one goes, yeah, I guess it's about four inches. The one, other one goes, yeah, okay. But that's about four inches, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, you're right, four, five, four and a half. Right? So they, they, they converge on an answer. What makes it powerful is, again, there isn't really any answer to that question. And so, there, so the, the, the way that you want to think about this is here's a situation where you put people in a room and they look to other people and their, their, their responses to things tend to converge on each other in this kind of conformist way, right? What's interesting about the phenomenon is that you can, he, he was interested in sort of playing this out. And so, uh, uh, you know, people who, had, who followed up on some of his studies, this is one of my favorites, a uh, study done by Jacobs and Campbell in 1961 where they took the, the basic situation, and in, in Sharif's original study, these are all regular old people, real subjects, right? But they did other subjects where they would, other studies where they would put a new person in who was designed to give a really high estimate or a really low estimate. And they found that that would, if one person confidently gave a high estimate, everybody else's estimates would go up. If somebody gave a low estimate, their estimates would go down. So J Jacobs and Campbell took advantage of this the, the, and they stuck it in a, in a, a confederate who uh, originally gave a very high estimate of the movement from 15 to 16 inches. The mean of the controls was about four. And then, what they had is when they brought in two other people, um, then those people would quickly conform to that standard. Then they would take the Confederate out and they'd put in another new subject. So now there's three new people, right? Three real subjects, right? So somebody went out, the Confederate's out, now another person's in. And they did that, they kept doing that. They just kept taking one person out every, every couple of trials and replacing new people in. So, it's, so very quickly, nobody who had ever seen the original Confederate, they were all in a study. What they found is that high estimate that the original group did persisted for five generations. Five full, taking everybody out, and putting everybody in. Taking everybody out and putting everybody in one at a time, right? So the original idea was trans admitted socially to these other people and it persisted. Just like whoever thought about wearing a tie a couple hundred years ago, everybody's still suffering from that right now. Even though I never met the guy, I don't wear ties, uh, I don't have to, luckily. But I mean, the people who wear them never met them. So this, it's a, he tried to recreate in the lab this kind of funny norm for formation process, right? This sort of creation of these norms. These studies made a big splash. People said, wow, that's really interesting. You know, wow, how, you know, how powerful these conformity pressures could be. All except for one social psychologist, a guy named Solomon Ash, uh, who uh, said, you know, this is ridiculous. This isn't right. This isn't, you know, people don't conform like that. The only reason they're conforming in this situation is because you put them in this ambiguous situation. You know, good college kids, they're going to stand up. We train them to, you know, to, to have to think for themselves, they're not going to conform. And so Solomon Ash went out to try and run a study to show that conformity wasn't nearly as powerful as Sharif thought it was. And he partially succeeded with that, but he also <coughs> provided social psychology with a second great demonstration of the power of conformity. And again, another really interesting but very different kind of experimental situation they put people in. So he would bring in Seven undergraduates. Well, you thought they were, they all thought they were undergraduates, but actually only one of them was a real subject. The other six were Confederates. They were just, they worked for him. And he presented them with a very simple task. He wanted to create a task where there was clearly, you know, ex very different from Sharif, clearly a right or a wrong answer, right? So he created the simplest task he could come up with. This, he called it a standard to matching task. Right, so they had, they were presented the standard line like this, they were asked, which of those comparison lines is the same length as that line on the left? So which of these is the same as the line on the left? And the answer is obviously C, right? Oh, the answer is obviously B, right? So it's just so clear that what, you know, which is the right answer here that, and he created this situation, he came up with a whole set of these 
that were so easy that 97% of people who took this test got it right every time, right? So that's like a mean in this class of 97 on the exam, right? So everybody gets 97 out of 100 questions right, right? Everybody. It's the worst anybody does, right? So it's a super easy test if you do it alone. But it, people didn't do it alone, right? They did it in these groups. And what they did is they did it out loud, and they would start here, this person would go, you know, what's the right answer? B, 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 B. They'd go through, and they'd go a couple trials, and then about the third trial, something funny would happen. This person would say, oh, it's A. Oh, it's A. A, A, A. What do you do? What do you say? It's obviously the wrong answer. What do you do, right? And so he embedded several trials like this, like tr 12 trials like this into the, this um, task that they were doing. There's 12 critical trials where everybody gave the wrong answer. And they look how often did the subject give the wrong answer. And what they found is that, yeah, conformity was lower. So there was only conformity on 37% of the trials. So but think about that for a minute. So 37% of the time, College kids would give the wrong, the obviously wrong answer when they're staring at this thing, just because the other kids gave the answer. Again, and only 24% of people gave an error-free performance. Compared, well, it's, I guess it was 99%, right? So 99% of the people get, it all, get them all right when they're alone, and it, you can drop that down to only 24% of the people get them, get them all right. So everybody pretty much bows to the pressure sometimes. So there's like, 20, again, 24% of the people get, uh, never make any mistakes, uh, but fully, over 30% of the people conformed on from one to three trials, get almost 50% on four to six, uh, over 50% on seven to nine, uh, and uh, some people conformed, you know, over 10% of the people conformed every single time. They gave the obviously wrong answer to a very easy question just because everybody else did it. Why do you think they did that? Somebody tell me, why, why do you think that they uh, gave the wrong answer? What do you think is going through their heads? Come on, raise your hand. Go up there. What do, you, what do you mean? Why don't they want to be different? So what, what do you think they fear? Humiliation. So being humiliated? Because what is, why would they, if they give the right answer, why would they be humiliated? So you're doing something different from everybody else. You don't know. Maybe you know, the rules are different. I don't know. Maybe I didn't. I, I'm not sure what's going on, right? But that's the power of the situation. Go ahead. Is it because they don't want to be excluded from the group? They don't want to be excluded from the group. That's what happens a lot of times, right? Why you might, uh, you know, listen to some music or somebody says, smoke the cigarette. And you go, oh, I don't want to smoke this cigarette. Oh, you know. You're, you're no good, We're not gonna, you're not part of our group, you might want to do that, right? In this situation, you think that's very powerful? They don't even know these people. But that's what's so powerful about it, is that we do that even when there's people we don't know, right? And there's really, these are two examples of conformity that illustrate some really basic principles and, and the, the multiple forces that make people conform. The, the Sharif study kind of demonstrates one kind and the, uh, uh, the ASH study you know, is a better demonstration than another. So let me talk about this. This is, this, this is a really fundamental concept. There's two different ways that people have influence over us. Two different kinds of pressure, if you want, that people can uh, apply to us. One is what's called normative social influence. So normative social influence stems from the fear of rejection or the desire for approval, right? So when groups, like in high school, they can make your life great. You can go to all the best parties, date all the best people, all that stuff if you go along, and you can be shunned if you don't, right? So that fear that people have sometimes will make them do what other people do. It tends to, this kind of normative influence to kind of comply is maximized when rewards and costs for going along are high and the stimulus is unclear, right? So when there's a really high costs and it's ambiguous in particular, right? right you just, when you don't really know what the right answer is, people very often will uh, always start, it's, it's the opposite. So when the stimulus is clear, right? Sorry, it must be early in the morning, I'm sorry. 
So here's the deal, right? So the normative pressure is, is highest. You can really tell when it's happening when the, there's an obvious answer, right? When there's pressure to go along, there's an obvious answer. Crow, smoking crack is bad, obviously. But I'm going to do it because I don't want to be excluded, right? And what it tends to, when you get that kind of situation, what it tends to manifest itself in what's called public compliance. People will go along, but they'll know that they're not doing the right thing. It's like, I'm doing this even though I know it's not right. right? So it doesn't necessarily change them inside, but they just go along to get along. This is kind of classic conformity, normative pressure. Would you go along to make people like you or not dislike you? But there's another more powerful kind of conformity, another effect that other people have on us, and that's called informational social influence. And this stems not from the need to go along and get along, not from that kind of fear of humiliation that you were talking about, but rather from our need to look to other people for clarification about what's going on. So most of the things that we know in this world are social things, right? We know them because other people believe them too. Right? And we look around and we decide, oh, this is the right thing to do because other people are doing it. Or that's the right answer because other people are answering those things. Almost all your political opinions, if you have them, are like that, right? You don't know the answers to the questions, but you know some group of people believe these things, other group of people those, oh, yeah, I kind of like these people, I'll go along with them, right? It's maximized when the rewards of cost for being correct are high, right, when you really want to know the answer and the stimulus is ambiguous. It isn't clear what really is the right answer then people will look to other people to kind of go along. And this kind of conformity is a deeper, more profound kind of conformity because it goes down into you and it creates what's called private acceptance. Not just public compliance when you do it but don't believe it. Informational social influence is the power that groups have to kind of make you believe things. Like, I, this must be the right answer so that you'll really believe those things. Right? You come to believe the things are true because you've gone along. And the stimulus is ambiguous. Right? You want to know the right answer. Other people think that's the right answer. It just makes sense. Right? That's the way the world must be. Right? So let's work through a couple of examples of these kinds of things to see. If you know, so what, what do you think is going on in the Sharif study here? Is that normative social influence or informational social influence? Somebody raise their hand. What do you think is primarily going on? Are they going along to, to not feel humiliated or are they going along because they want to know the right answer? <coughs> Speak up real loud. I can't hear. Why? Why informational? Right, that's what, it's classically kind of this informational social, so they're in this group and they may feel, and again the answer is always kind of both, right, both p powers are always operative, so you don't, you feel funny doing what other people aren't doing, but large in that situation it's not clear at all that they, it's not really moving. So you're staring at it and other people are going four inches, you're going, yeah, okay, these reasonable looking people say it's four inches, I guess it is about four inches. Right? They think there's a right answer. They think there's a real answer to the question. So they're looking at other people and they're, they're looking to them for clarification like we do. We, if you don't know the answers to things, you go and ask people, what do you do? And if other people believe things, you go, well, yeah, that must be, must be true. Right? So the primary power in this Sharif situation right, is this informational social influence. What about, this is actually, this is my favorite picture, this is the actual picture of subjects in the uh, Ash paradigm. This guy's the real subject. This is what happens when everybody's said the wrong answer. <laughs> so what do you think is going on in this situation? How, normative, informational? Lay in the back again. Why? Uh huh. Does he look like he's completely convinced of, that he knows the right answer? Yeah, 
Yeah, so normative influence is clearly higher in this situation, right? He's, you're in this real interpersonal situation there. Other people are doing this thing. It feels really weird to say the opposite thing. So you're feeling, and what, again, what's powerful to a certain extent is that even people you don't know can have this effect on you. I'm always freaked out. I just was in Mexico, you know, and you're walking around, and wife's always going, oh, nobody knows what you, who you are, but you have this feeling like, well, I, you know, I still shouldn't do certain things because, you know, they're people. Right? So we have this sense that of, of everyone's like this. But there's also another thing I want to point out is that there's a real element of informational social influence in there too. He's just not sure what's happening. And then you get a lot of people doing that where they, you know, they, and they, sort of, they talk about afterwards, you know, like, they're taking their glasses, they're moving, they're going, they're thinking, well, maybe I misunderstood the question. Maybe I, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm not seeing things right. They, so they are, when other people behave differently, we wonder whether we know what's happening or not. And that's the informational element to it too. So there's both are operating in most situations and sometimes informational and normative influence, right, wax and wane a little bit and it's kind of, it's a kind of a fun game to see if you can figure out which one is really going on in these situations. And in most situations have a little bit of both. So let me give you another uh, fun example of uh, this kind of thing and we're going to, so this is actually a clip from uh, this wonderful TV show that was on when I was a kid called Candid Camera. Uh, anybody know about Candid, hear about Candid Canberra? A guy named Alan Funt was the uh, head of this. And they were just, it was like the first reality TV show. They would bring people in, put them in all these weird situations, film them, and talk about it. But what, the, Alan Funt had this wonderful sort of social psychological sense. And many of the studies that he did, one of the little situations he put people in for fun, actually reveal some really interesting psychological truths. So watch this. This is what happens when you put people in an elevator and subject them to people doing funny things. And so let's watch this and think about it, and think about whether it th what's normative or informational about this. So here we go. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> his individuality, but little by little, he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And, uh, this man has apparently been in groups before. Is <laughs> a fellow with his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> now we'll see if we can use. Now we'll see if we can use group pressure for some good. Now, in a moment, on Charlie's signal, everybody turns forward. Very nice. They take off their hats. <laughs> and now, do you think we could reverse the procedure? Watch. <laughs> Wonderful situation you created, right? So what is it, normative or informational? Who, what do you think is going on there? And what parts of it are, are which? Raise your hand, come on. Okay. Why? He doesn't want to look foolish. Uh huh. That's all I got. Uh huh. <laughs> do you think he looks foolish? Does it look? Does it look like he's? I mean, we want, I want you to really watch their faces and things. What do you like? What do you think is going in this? What do you think is going on? The last guy in particular. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody want to disagree with that? Think it's informational? Go ahead. Uh 
Uh huh. Yeah, you can see his eyes too. His eyes are, all of them are. They're, they're going, what's going on? They're trying to figure out what's happening, right? So they're going, there must be some reason why we're turning around, right? And there's this power of this kind of, you know, embarrassment and there's this other thing of what's happening here? Why are people doing things like this? And if they're doing it, well, there must be a reason. And that's, that's how deeply embedded we are, right, in, in the social fabric, right? When other people do things for no reason, you've been, this guy's been on an elevator a thousand times. Right? Very few of them open it back. Very few often do people turn around. But in this situation, he wonders, well, maybe there's something funny going on here. Right? And it's not as visceral. It's this deep, deeply ingrained sort of sense of, whoa, boy, other people are doing things. You know, I, 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 there must be something going on. And if, if there isn't something going on, then I'm going to look really stupid if I don't do this. Right? So they're kind of intertwined, these two powers that sometimes we go along to make friends and sometimes we go along to know the right answer. Those two probably aren't unrelated, right? So one of the reasons, if you don't do what other people do, what do they do to you? Right? They will ostracize you. So sometimes, again, what, you know, we want to figure out what the right answer is because we don't want to be ostracized. So the informational norm of influence are all wrapped up in one another, right? There's really an interesting phenomenon. There's been hundreds of studies done on conformity in various ways. Let's tell you about a couple other little phenomena really quickly to finish up. So one of the things you might wonder is, well, how, how much conformity do you need? How many people do you need to create conformity? And the answer is a couple. And uh, that basically, the more people you have, the more conformity you get up to a point. So this is actually a set of studies uh, that were done. And Solomon Ash did a whole series of studies looking at you know, what happens if only one other person gives the wrong answer, what happens to two other people, what happens to three other people, what happens to four other people, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And you see that what happens is you get, after, after one, you get a little bit of conformity. Two is a big jump. Right? If two people give the wrong answer, all of a sudden you're going, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, this, and at three, it jumps up a lot. And then actually at four, five, and six, you know, or uh, up there, it doesn't seem to matter. Kind of what's called an asymptote. It just sort of flattens out, right? So after a few, and so what do you think that's normative? Or you think that's informational? Why does it, why do more people make you conform more? And a little bit of both, right? You know, the other people, you don't want them to ostracize you, but some of it's got to be informational. It's just like if three other people are doing this, there must be something going on, right? So let me, so, so this is a great study just like this. There was a study in, uh, done a lot of, in the 1970s, lots of social psychologists were roaming New York City and they would do studies in the streets. And here's a study where they just had somebody, it's actually Stanley Milgram, we're going to see his uh, you know, classic, uh, uh, the film about his experiments next time. Right, so Stanley Milgram set up a situation where people were standing, somebody in New York City, they came across uh, one of his confederates who was standing in, uh, you know, on the sidewalk doing this. Right, and they just simply measured how likely the next person coming up stopped and went, <laughs> and looked up. And what they found is you put one, they either put one person, uh, or you know, what's the chance that they just would spontaneously do it, there's one person standing in the street, look it up, two, three, five, ten, fifteen people standing in the street going like this. <laughs> so what do people do? They look up, right? So this is just the probability that somebody looks up. Again, nobody does it spontaneously after one person, still 40% of the people look up. I don't know how many people you looked up or looked up when I looked up. It gets more, but at some point, again, here at about five, it just flattens out. So again, you get five people standing in the middle of the street looking up. What do you... Why do you look up? Because you're embarrassed not to look up? No, you look up because you wonder whether what, what's up there. What are they looking at? Right? So it's that, this power of, that other people have, this sort of informational power. Another really important thing, the last kind of important thing about conformity is that it gains a lot of its power from unanimity when everybody's doing the same thing. So the powerful thing in that Ash study, right, is that six people all give the wrong answer. So what happens if only five of them gave the wrong answer and one gave the right answer, right? And what you find is there's this phenomenon that's kind of called punctured unanimity, that if one person dissents from it, conformity goes way down. It's a little bit hard. So this is the correct estimates. So this line here is the no opposition. So this is when people get them all right. These are the critical trials, right? This is, and this is how likely they are to give the right answer. So when there's no opposition, they almost always give the right answer. When they're alone against the majority, they're, they're, they tend to conform, right? So they give the wrong answers, so their accuracy goes way down. 
But when there's just one other person who gives the right answer, they almost pop all the way, all the way back up again. Right? So if one person dissents, if you could have one other dissenter, right, that gives you a lot of power, right? That when it's punctured, conformity drops almost to zero. And in fact, what you found in one study is that all somebody has to say, what all one of the other six people has to say is, I'm not sure. And that brings performance, it drops conformity almost to zero, right? So if one person says, I don't, I don't really know, right, then all of a sudden you feel freed up to say, I don't know either, or I think that's the right answer, right? So some of it is, that, and again, what I want to stress in this is a lot of this has to do with this, this sort of notion of informational social influence. So the power of conformity isn't just this traditional kind of thing that we think about, right? You're just going along to avoid things. We look to other people, we conform to what they do because they, we, we look to them to figure out what the world's like. And if everybody is saying one thing, right, we'll very often say that thing even though it's ridiculous. Right, you can make people believe ridiculous things or at least entertain the idea that that might be true. It's not clear that everybody in the ASH study really believed it, but they very often would, would say, I don't really know what was going on, right? So you can really change people that way, right? And it's because of this power that social situations had to affect our behavior. And many of the classic social psychological experiments make that point. No study makes that point better than the Milgram obedience experiments. We're gonna talk about those, watch that movie and talk about it next time. Have a great weekend.